I want to turn to John's Gospel, the 8th chapter. The 8th chapter of John's Gospel. And this passage of Scripture, the 32nd verse, the 32nd verse of the 8th chapter of John's Gospel. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's having a debate with some of the religious leaders of his day. And he said, ye shall know the truth. Now that word shall could be translated must. You must know the truth if you are to be free. Tonight I want to talk about truth and freedom. We hear a great deal about both today. You know, there's an old Scottish oath upon which our American oath is based, and it reads this way. I pledge before Almighty God, before whom I will give an answer on the day of judgment, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now in this passage of Scripture, Jesus discussed two personalities. He discussed God on the one hand, who is truth, and Satan on the other, who is, the, who is a liar and the author of lies. Now here's what Jesus said. He was pretty rough in some of the things he said. He turned to these religious leaders and he said, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said that there's the lie and the truth. And in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, we are told that in the latter days of this age, there will be a system called the lie and a great delusion will sweep over the people of that generation they will believe a lie and they will reject the truth many people think we're living in that generation and the Apostle Paul said in the first chapter of Romans that the people of that day had changed the truth of God into a lie and then secondly, not only do we exchange the truth of God for a lie, but Paul said in Romans, the first chapter, the 18th verse, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, you can know the truth and not live it. This is holding the truth of God in unrighteousness. The Bible says the wrath of God is against such people. And that's why Christ was so bitter in his denunciation of the hypocrites. You hold the truth intellectually, but you don't live it. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You can hold the truth in unrighteousness, and that brings about the wrath of God. And then thirdly, Paul said, judgment according to truth, Romans 2, 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. In other words, someday God is going to judge the world. Yes? There's a day of judgment coming. Just as certain as I'm standing here, a day of judgment is coming and God is going to judge us according to the truth. Did we live by the truth? Did we believe the truth? Did we accept the truth? What was our attitude toward the truth? Or did we exchange the truth for a lie? Or did we hold the truth in unrighteousness? God will hold us accountable, the Scripture says. Jesus said, you must know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, you know, that's what philosophy has been doing, and that's what science does, and that's what we do in psychology. In every field of study, in every discipline, we're searching for truth. We're trying to find what the laws are. We're trying to find what the truth is. Now, early in childhood, we soon learned the truth that fire is hot. We learned that ice is cold. We learned that doing wrong makes us feel guilty and doing good makes us feel good. We learned that early. 
You see, all of us really are on a quest for truth. What is the truth about myself? Where did I come from? Why in the world did God ever put us on this planet if there's a God? And where are we going? Is there life after death? I'm searching for answers. All of us are, consciously or unconsciously. We ask ourselves these questions. What is truth? The same question Pilate asked 2,000 years ago. And that's why a lot of these kids are taking LSD and mind expansion psychedelic drugs. They're trying to find some experiences that will lead them into some sort of a spiritual truth. Now, truth is important in mathematics, it's important in chemistry, it's important in science, and it's important in the spiritual life. It's important in morality. It's important to find the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. No guesswork, no speculation is allowed. In aviation, you can make one mistake nowadays and may crash into another plane. You must know the truth. Now, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. The Apostle Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. The Apostle John said, you can know that you're saved. The Bible teaches that you can know the truth. You can find the truth. You can believe the truth. But what is the truth? Every religion and every philosophy may have some of the truth. But there is one place you can find all the truth. Where is it? Jesus said, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Buddha said, I'm still searching for truth at the end of his life. But Jesus made this astounding claim. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the embodiment of all truth. And if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to believe that. And you've got to take it by faith. Well, you say anybody that would come along and say, I'm the embodiment of all truth. He must be mentally deranged. He's an egomaniac. Yes, you can, you can make that. You can make a case for that. Or maybe Jesus just told a lie. He knew it wasn't true and he just lied. Yes, that's one of the options. But suppose he is the truth. Suppose he is the embodiment of all truth. And you reject it and exchange the truth for a lie. Then you have made a fatal error for eternity. Now, I personally believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that he is the embodiment of all truth. I have accepted that by faith. And when I took that step and took that stand, it changed my life. And it's very simple. And he made it so simple that you can know the truth that a blind man, a deaf man, a black man, a yellow man, a red man can come and know the truth. The educated man can know the truth. The uneducated can know the truth. I know people that don't have any education at all. And they know this truth. And it gives them a satisfaction and a joy. And I know professors at the great universities and I know some of the great scientists, they have come and accepted this as the truth and bowed in humility before the Christ back of science. And it's changed their lives. Truth. The profoundest truth in simplicity. So that anybody can come and anybody can believe, even children. Whittier once said, we search the world for truth. We call the good and the pure and the beautiful from graven stone and written scroll, from all the plowed fields of the soul and weary seekers of the best. We come back laden from the quest to find that all the stage is set in the book our mothers read. It's here. 
Jesus Christ, the story of Christ, He is the truth. And Jesus said this in that same chapter, in the 24th verse, He said, If ye believe not, listen to this, if you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you believe not that I am the embodiment of all truth, you're going to die in your sins. You must come and believe and accept and commit. Yes, Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. And Jesus told the truth. He told the truth about sin. Where does the lust and the greed and the pride and the hate and the jealousy and the fighting come from? Why, does, why do people hate each other? Why do they fight and kill and every generation has a war? We've had 55 wars since World War II. Why, why all of this throughout history? The Bible tells us man has a disease of the heart called sin. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and blasphemy and pride. All of these things come from within and defile a man. We're suffering from only one disease in the world. Our problem is not a race problem, really. Our problem is not a poverty problem. Our problem is not a war problem. Our problem is a heart problem. We need to get the heart changed, the heart transformed. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must have a new nature, a new heart that will be dominated by love. Ah, but we go out and say we ought to love each other. And we, saw, and we soon find that we don't have the capacity to love each other where we're going to get it. We get it from Jesus. You see, the Spirit of God comes into our heart the moment we receive Christ and He begins to produce in your heart love and joy and peace and patience and temperance. All of these fruits of the Spirit are produced supernaturally by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. He told the truth about what is wrong with the world. And then he told the truth about our social responsibility, our responsibility to our fellow man. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 35, you'll find it. People were hungry. They were sick. They were tired. They were cold. And they were visited in prison. And they were visited and they were helped. And at the judgment Jesus commended them. They said, but Lord, we didn't know that we visited you. We didn't know that we fed you. We didn't know that we did that for you. Jesus said, if you did it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And every time that you give of your time and your energy and your money to help those in need, you're helping Jesus. You're giving to him. And then he told the truth about judgment. He warned us to flee the wrath of God. Every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment, he said. There is a judgment coming. He told the truth about repentance. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. You say, but how do I repent? You say, oh God, I've sinned. I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing to live in a new dimension of life. I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. That's repentance. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. He told the truth about that. He told the truth about conversion. He said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Be converted. We're frightened of that word in religion. We use it in everything else, but not in religion. Young people want an experience. They want something that means something. They have their happenings and they want to do their thing and they want to take their drug, they want their kicks. And in the church, we've stifled out any kind of religious experience. Jesus said you need to be converted. I can remember the day I was converted. I had an experience with God. It wasn't an emotional experience with me. Some people it is. Nothing wrong with emotion. We've got certainly emotional intellectualism today on campus. 
I see these intellects on campus on television and boy they're shouting it up pretty loud for their cause and what they believe now we allow emotion for everything except Christ if anybody sheds a tear on religion they say too much emotion and that's one of the devil's lies and the devil's tricks so that we've lost all feeling in our faith and all joy in our faith and all the excitement and the thrill that these early Christians had Jesus said you need to be converted now the word conversion simply means to change turn around you're going in one direction on the broad road that leads to destruction turn around and go in the right direction go the narrow road that leads to eternal life that's what it means conversion to change to turn around has that happened to you have you changed your way of living have you had an experience with Christ Do you know him personally ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free now I know that there are many people that think they're free already and they don't know Christ they think they know how to live the Bible says there is a way there's a way outside of Christ that seems right in demand it seems the right thing but the end is death and judgment I have a little boy and when he was much smaller three years of age we were loaned a boat down in Florida and uh, we were going down the river my friend Lee Fisher was back there trying to get the fishing gear ready and I was running the boat and my little boy Ned said daddy I want to run this boat and I said no I don't think you know how to run it oh yes I know exactly how to do it he said and he pushed my hands out of the way so I let him have the wheels and he was heading right toward the rocks you see we all say Lord we know how to run our lives don't you interfere we're, we're gonna be all right we can handle it nothing we can't handle but Jesus warns us that you're heading for the rocks you're in trouble emptiness neurosis complexes of various thoughts set in and ultimately the judgment repent be converted while you can now is the accepted time today is the day of salvation now what does the truth do it sets you free ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free from what first it sets you free Christ sets you free from the penalty of sin yes there's a penalty to sin now we're all sinners every one of us a sinner and we're all under the penalty of sin which is death the wages of sin is death the Bible says now death carries with it the idea of separation from God in this life and in the life to come the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said what must I do to inherit eternal life he wanted life here and he wanted life to come because he felt the deadness of his spirit and the deadness of his soul but he wasn't willing to pay the price there's a price if you come to Christ the rich young ruler tried to bargain with Jesus he wanted Jesus to lower the flag he wanted Jesus to change the rules for him so he could get into the kingdom but Jesus will never lower the flag he'll never compromise he'll never change the rules you've got to come to Christ just like people did 2,000 years ago if you're able to get to heaven we live in sophisticated America we thought we had all the answers and look at us sending a man to the moon with one hand and building gigantic bombs and rockets with the other to blow the world to pieces campuses torn apart society being ripped apart no we don't have all the answers because you see we rejected the truth we rejected Christ receive Christ in your life let him come and put the pieces back together in your life forgive your sin and give you purpose and meaning to your life and take the penalty of sin away there is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ he removes the penalty secondly he set you he can set you free from the power of sin he said whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin in this chapter but when you receive Christ 
This power of sin to dominate your life is broken. Sin shall no longer dominate in your life, said Paul to the Romans. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You can reckon yourself to be dead to sin. So that sin may be in your life, you may commit a sin, but it doesn't dominate you. You don't make sin a practice in your life. You have power over sin, the Spirit of God living in you through a new nature that God gives you. And then thirdly, he sets us free ultimately from the very presence of sin. You read the Revelation, the 21st chapter and the 22nd chapter, and you will see the most glorious description of heaven and the future world. And then it says this. It says, on the outside of this new world, this utopia that is called heaven, that God is building now for those that trust him, for without are the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. All liars, all people that live a lie will be on the outside, he said, excluded and banished from the presence of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There was an ad in the New York Times today, a whole page that said, come to life. Great big boxcar letters, come to life. I'm asking you tonight to come to life. Come to the truth, to the source of life. To Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Someday we'll be removed from the very presence of sin and the devil and all lies. We shall overcome someday. Till then, we can have God's life right here on this earth. We can have a little bit of heaven. We can be set free from the bondage of sin and slavery and the devil right now. Christ can set you free. I'm asking you tonight by faith to receive Him. To receive the truth. Notice I said by faith. You cannot come with your mind alone because your mind was affected by sin. You have to come like a little child except you become His children and be converted, said Jesus. You have to come like a little child by simple childlike faith and receive it. And if you will, He comes into your heart gives you a new nature and you can go out and live a new life now it's hard and it's tough and it's rough to follow Christ I don't want you to come under any false illusion but when you make that commitment you don't go back into the world and back to your house and back to your neighborhood to live the Christian life alone he goes with you I'm going to ask you to come tonight and receive him openly and publicly Every person that he called in the New Testament, he called publicly. There was a reason for it. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Come publicly. I'm going to ask you from all over this stadium to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently and say tonight, I want to receive Christ. I want the truth. I want the truth to dominate my life. But you get up and come right now from all over. Men, women, young people. God has spoken to you tonight. You need Christ. You come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. I do not know whether you can see this great scene here at the garden in New York or not, but hundreds of people are coming from all over this great amphitheater to
to receive Christ as the way and the truth and the life in their hearts. You can make that same commitment right now in your home where you are watching by television. God help you to make that commitment tonight. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to 1 John, the fifth chapter. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I want to speak about knowing, being absolutely sure that you know Christ, because it was written to give you assurance that your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven. The Gospel of John, though, was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In other words, the Gospel of John was written to bring you to Christ and the little Johns were written to help you to know how to live the Christian life and to be sure that you do know Christ. There's so many people that go to church and so many people that have been baptized and so many people that have been confirmed in the church, but they don't have the assurance. They don't have the certainty. They don't know for sure that Christ lives in their heart. So 1 John was written that you might know that you have eternal life. In 1 John 3, 23 it says, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you believe? Well, you say, yes, I believe. Do you really? Do you know what believe means in the Bible? What, it, what faith is in the Bible? It means that you put your total weight on Christ. It's the story that I told the other night. I'll tell it again about this fellow that came over from France and he announced that he was going to put a tightrope across Niagara River at Niagara Falls and he was going to walk across it. Well, a big crowd of people gathered on both sides of the river, the Canadian side and the American side, and they watched. And sure enough, he walked over and he walked back and they applauded. He did it two or three times and then he took a wheelbarrow and he put 200 pounds of dirt in it and rolled it over and rolled it back and rolled it over and rolled it back. Then he asked, how many of you believe I can roll a man across? And they said, oh, we know you can do it. And so there was one man in the front row that was quite enthusiastic about it. And he said, sir, he said, would you mind stepping in the wheelbarrow and being the first man? Well, that man was gone. I don't blame him. But you see, that's what faith is. You put your total weight in the wheelbarrow. You put your total weight on Christ. And Christ is the one that you are to put your faith in. Whosoever believeth that Christ is, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of things not seen. Real faith carries with it the idea of commitment. Not just believing with your head, but a commitment of your life, of every phase of your life to Christ, your vocation, your studies, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your sex life, everything is committed to Christ. The first question is, do you really believe, have you really committed your life to Christ 
all the way. Get that settled. Then the second question in this examination. A changed attitude toward sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yes, as Christians, sometimes we sin. We may sin without knowing it because there are sins of omission, sins of commission, somebody you should have helped, somebody you should have smiled to today that would have encouraged them and you didn't do it. But he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you do sin, there's a remedy. God will forgive you if you confess it. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The blood that was shed on the cross when Christ died has the power 2,000 years later to wash all your sins away. I thank God that he stayed on that cross and when they put those nails in his hands and the spike through his feet and the spear in his side, he stayed there. He didn't come down. He stayed on the cross because he loved you. He loves you tonight. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, however bad you've been, he loves you. And when he uses them, Now, after you have come to Christ, what should be your attitude towards sin? First, if you do commit a sin, confess it immediately. Secondly, forsake it immediately with his help. Thirdly, seek after righteousness and holiness. Be sure that you don't do that again. You know, some people will commit a sin and then they come to God and ask for forgiveness. And then they'll go and commit the same sin, commit it over and over and over again. It means you turn from sin. You don't go back and do that again. In the 23rd Psalm, David said, He restores my soul. Do you need your soul restored tonight? There are hundreds of people here tonight that are believers, but you need to rededicate your life. You need a new surrender. There are people here tonight that God is calling to be a missionary. There are people here tonight that God is calling to work in the church. There are people here tonight that God is asking to speak to people where they live and where they work, to speak to them about Christ. And that's mission work. If you're a member of the body of Christ and have rebelled, you can confess it and you can receive forgiveness and full restoration and he restores your soul. That's a wonderful thing. And then the third question is this. Do you have a desire to obey God? 1 John 2, 3 says, And hereby we know that we, have, that we know him if we keep his commandments. Go through the New Testament and mark up every place where it says you should do this or you should live this way and find where you failed. An infallible sign of the new birth is that we, may, we want to obey Christ. I don't obey Christ because I'm afraid not to obey Him. I obey Him because I want to. I love Christ. I want to obey His will. I want to do the things He wants me to do. Like a daily devotional life. It's hard to have a daily devotional life because the devil fights you, sir. If you open the Bible and start reading, the devil will make you sleepy. Or somebody will come in immediately and uh, want to talk to you. Or maybe there's a good TV program on and the temptation is to turn that TV program on. And you don't have time to pray and you don't have time to read the Bible. Then fourthly, there's the separation from the world in 1 John 2. I love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all, that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And if you love the world more than you do Christ, you're not in the kingdom of God. And how many of us tonight love the world? The devil is called the God of this world. He's called the prince and power of the air. He has tremendous power. There are many demons in the world. And those demons are working with the devil to destroy your Christian life. The moment you receive Christ, the devil is going to be after you. He's going to tempt you. He'll bring things to you that you never dreamed you'd be tempted to do. Temptation is not of God. Temptation comes from the devil. And how do you fight the devil? He tempted Jesus. He caught Jesus at a time when Jesus had not eaten or had anything to drink for 40 days and 40 nights in a wilderness. And he tempted Jesus three times and they were real temptations. And how did Jesus combat him? He didn't argue. He didn't debate. He didn't use his supernatural power. He just quoted scripture. Every time Satan came with his temptation, Jesus quoted a passage from the Old Testament, a scripture verse. And that's the reason it's very important to memorize all the scripture you can. I've reached the age where it's hard to memorize scripture. I wish I'd memorized 10,000 times more than I did when I was young. While you're young, while you're in school and after you leave school, those early years, you can retain scripture. You see, you, you take a scripture verse and memorize it and that'll stay with you all your life if you, if you repeat it week after week and week after week. It's yours for life and when the devil comes with his temptation, you're there with the sword because the scripture is called the sword of the spirit and that's your, battle, that, that's your armor that you use to fight Satan when he comes. Are you separated from the world? The scripture says, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. And you know, when, when I face some situation, shall I watch this TV program? Shall I go to this film? Shall I do this particular thing that's in the world? And there's a doubt in my mind as to whether I should do it or not do it. There are certain questions one can ask yourself. First, I ask myself, does it violate any principle of Scripture? The thing I'm thinking about doing, does it violate any principle of Scripture? Secondly, does it take the keen edge off my Christian life? I'm not keen for God after seeing that as I was before I saw it. Thirdly, can I ask God's blessing on it? And then I ask myself the fourth question, is it a stumbling block to others? If someone else who was a believer saw me doing this thing, saying that thing, losing my temper, whatever. It, is that going to be a stumbling block to them? And then the fifth question I ask myself is, do I love other Christians of all denominations? Do I love other people? Do I love the poor? enough to do something about helping them in their poverty? Do I love the people in my own neighborhood who have a different color skin? Do I really love them? Or do I just put it on? Is this just an act that I put on? Is it a real love affair with people, no matter what their background may be? The scripture says we know that we've been passed from death to life because we love. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Many children of God who do not walk with Christ think that other things are more attractive than walking with Christ and asking ourselves such questions as this. 
How can we live in the present society and be separated from the world that is run by the devil? How can we? Only with the help of Christ. And then sixthly, if you really know Christ, you do not practice sin. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. The devil can't touch him. You say, but it says sins not. That word actually means doesn't practice sin. You may make a mistake and you may yield for a moment and you may fall one time or two times or ten times or twenty times or whatever it may be. But you won't practice sin. You won't do it over and over and over and over again. You'll confess it and forsake it and give it up and say, Lord, help me. I'm so weak. I need your help to live a Christian life. And then seventhly, there's the witness of the Spirit. If you really know Christ, you will know it because there'll be a witness of the Spirit in your heart. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do I know? Not only the Word of God tells me, not only my life tells me that I know God, but it's like the little boy that was flying his kite and the kite had gotten out of sight like these low clouds that we're here today and uh, the top of the towers the television towers you could you couldn't see the very top because the clouds were so low and this boy's kite had disappeared it had gotten so high but he was holding on he couldn't see it and somebody said what are you doing he said I'm flying a kite they said we don't see a kite how do you know it's up there oh he said I feel the tug of it and when you come to know Christ you feel the tug of Christ in your heart and you know that he lives in your heart do you feel that tug in your heart do you do you if you're not absolutely sure that Christ lives in your heart and you're totally committed to him, you can make this the moment in which a great transformation takes place in your life. No, and you will have a power that you don't have. You see, we're talking about yielding totally, not to yourself and not to your friends, not to the material things, but yielding to Christ. A yielded mind makes an intelligent Christian. Now secondly, a yielded sex life makes a dynamic Christian. Yes, there's nothing wrong with sex. God gave it to us. It's one of his great gifts to us. It's for our enjoyment. It's for to keep the race going. And we're to enjoy sex, but within the bonds of matrimony. Sex is for human reproduction and the fulfillment of married love. All those other functions we're trying to use sex for are merely unsolved spiritual problems which only Christ can solve. And then a yielded body makes a useful Christian. In Romans 6, it says, Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin control you, that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice acceptable unto God. Our bodies belong to God. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, a yielded heart makes a devoted Christian. The American Heart Indi Association indicates that 27 Americans are afflicted with heart disease. But we also have the, disease, the spiritual disease of the heart. The Bible talks about in Proverbs 12, the deceit that's in the heart. Proverbs 14, man is a backslider in heart. Proverbs 18, the heart of man is haughty. Proverbs 22, sin is bound up in the heart. Man's real heart problem is spiritual. That's the reason you need to come to the cross, to find forgiveness, to find a new life. And he says he'll give you a new heart and turn you completely around. And then lastly, a yielded will makes a forceful and a determined Christian. A yielded will. You see, there are three little men that live inside of all of us. There's the mind, there's the emotion, and there's the will. The scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. It doesn't say whosoever achieves or whoever understands or whosoever deserves it, or, but it says whosoever will. The door to the kingdom of God is open to every person here tonight to live a victorious life, to live a glorious life in which you know your destiny and you know your purpose and meaning. I read about some years ago, they had a great meeting in England of uh, factory workers. And Dwight L. Moody was speaking to them and he closed by saying, I'm offering you Jesus Christ, Christ who died on the cross and who rose again for you. I'm offering you Christ and I want you to stand up and say, I will or I won't. I will receive him. Or I won't receive him. And the man stood hesitatingly up and he said, I will. Another one said, I won't. Another one said, I will. Another one said, I won't. Another one said, I will. Another one said, I won't. And the audience was divided. About half said, I will follow Christ. I will serve him. I will surrender to him. But another half said, I won't. Which would you be? Which, which group would you be in? Because you see, when your will responds, it can also say, I won't. Which are you going to say tonight? I'm going to ask you to say tonight, I will. I will, to the best of my knowledge, receive Christ into my heart. And I want to live the kind of life you've been talking about. I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, I don't have, I just feel that I can't do it. But I'm willing to start. And I'm willing to say tonight, I will, with God's help, yield my life to Christ as Savior and Lord and Master. And He may speak to you about serving Him in some other part of the world. My oldest son, just Franklin, just came back from Sudan. He said he saw suffering on a scale that he had never seen anywhere in his travels in the world. What God could do with some of you people in places like that. What are you going to say tonight? I will or I won't? I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. All of you that will say, I will. I want you to get up out of your seat and come and stand here in front as we've seen every night and say tonight I will open my heart to Christ, I will receive Him, I will surrender to Him. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm living for Christ. I want to serve Him. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. 
Why do I ask you to come forward publicly like this? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward and standing publicly that pleases Christ and helps you to mean it. If you're in the choir, you come. If you're a Sunday school teacher or if you're even a pastor of a church and you're not sure how you stand before God, you get up and come. We're going to wait on it. Waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. The ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'll come to the text a little bit later. I want to speak tonight on the subject, three things, three things you cannot do without. Three things you cannot do without. My father was not a poor man. He was not a wealthy man. He would be called middle income. He made whatever you can make on a two or three hundred acre red dirt farm in North Carolina. I never did look at his bank account, never knew how much he made. He seemed to have enough on the table and we always had one suit of clothes a year and we had five cents of ice cream every Saturday night and we did pretty well. Look at the Waltons. You'll see a little bit about how we lived in those days in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, Immanuel Kant once said, a man is rich not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. You're not rich by what you own, but what you can do without. I've always remembered that statement. And as we're entering a recession, I guess we're in one, or a depression, whatever you call this that we're in. You'd be amazed at what you can do without. We may have to go back and live like we lived when I was a boy, and I, but I'll tell you, you could walk down the streets of all the towns around there and you wouldn't be afraid of being hit over the head or mugged. You never heard of a rape. I guess they had them. I never heard of them. I don't ever recall hearing about a murder in our community. And somehow or another, we children thought we were the happiest people in the world. And we had to work from three in the morning till sunset. My mother always served breakfast at 5.30 every morning. And we didn't know how bad off we were. Now, the Bible says there are at least three things you can't do without. If you are to have joy and peace and assurance and your sins forgiven and to know that you're going to heaven, what are they? The first one is found in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross and shed his blood for your sins, you could never have forgiveness. You would be a lost soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Because from Genesis to Revelation, blood is shed. And why? Leviticus 17, 11, Moses said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, if you're an average person, you have five quarts of blood circulating in your body every 23 seconds. Blood carries the garbage out without contamination. It's the most mysterious substance in the whole anatomy. Nobody exactly knows all about the blood. And we're all related by blood. You may be a black man, a brown man, a yellow man. Whatever your background, you are related to me by blood. 
our blood can, if it's the same type, can be interchanged within the races. The scripture says, the apostle Paul said, God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. When I have a blood transfusion, as I've had on several occasions when I've had operations, I didn't ask him, what's the color of the man's skin that blood came out of? I just want to get it in there fast as I can. Our blood, we're related. We're related to Adam. Adam and Eve were the first parents. And Adam and Eve sinned against God and they broke God's law. They rebelled against God. And then an interesting thing happened. They tried to cover their sins with fig leaves. And they couldn't do it. You know what God did? God went out and slew some animals and blood was shed. And God was teaching man from the Garden of Eden to this very hour that if you are to have forgiveness of sin, blood has to be shed. And you go all the way down through the Old Testament, it's the same thing. Or go in the New Testament, it's the same thing. When Cain and Abel, they were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain came along and brought his sacrifice, but there was no blood in it. Abel brought his, and there was blood in it. God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's, and Cain got mad and became jealous of his brother and killed him, and you had the first murder in the history of the human race, according to the Bible. And then you remember that night in Egypt. God said, I'm going to kill as a judgment in Egypt. The firstborn of every house in all of Egypt and every Jew remembers that even to this hour, and they celebrate it every year. I want you to take some blood, an animal, slay an animal, take the blood and put it on the doorpost, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Not when I see your good works, not when I see how rich you are, not when I see what church you belong to, but when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Why? You go to the communion on Sunday and you take of the wine or the grape juice, whatever your church serves. That wine or that grape juice stands for blood, the blood that was shed on the cross. John the Baptist cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he call him a lamb? Because as a lamb he was going to the cross. His blood was to be shed for your sins. He takes away the sins of the world. And that blood tonight can cleanse every sin you've ever committed. There's power in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness tonight? Do you want forgiveness of every single sin? Because you see, you cannot get into heaven If you're guilty of a single sin when you get to the entrance of heaven. Every sin has to be forgiven. And there's no way for sin to be forgiven except by Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now blood, of course, is symbolic in the Bible. It means the life of Christ was given for us at the cross. And when he died on that cross and shed that blood, God accepted that sacrifice instead of you having to make a sacrifice. In other words, you won't have to spend a day at the judgment. You won't have to spend one day in hell. You will be forgiven as though you had never sinned by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The scripture says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without stain. One of the most popular songs a couple of years ago was, Oh, Happy Day When Jesus Washed My Sins Away. And in Revelation 12 we read, They overcame how? By the blood of the lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus paid the ransom. I read the other day about this Italian playboy that was kidnapped and they're holding him right now for ransom for $16 million. And there's a popular song right now also that says, don't pay the ransom. 
But if Jesus had not been willing to go to that cross and pay the ransom with his own blood, you couldn't be saved. You couldn't have forgiveness. And on the cross, God is saying something to all of us. He's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to see my only son die. The angels couldn't believe it. They pulled their swords, 72,000 of them ready to come and sweep this whole planet into oblivion and rescue the Son of God. But he never called them. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. He died and he shed his blood on that cross for you. And without the shedding of blood, you could not be forgiven. The second thing that you can't do without Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Just turn a couple pages over. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now, Christ has already done the work on the cross, but now comes your part. Without faith, you cannot please Him. Hebrews 11 has been called God's Hall of Fame. And after this passage, some of the men and women of faith are listed, like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and even a prostitute, Rahab, because she too believed in God and proved her faith by her works. Well, you say, what is faith? I've committed all kinds of sins, and, and, and I know that I, I have to have the blood, and now I find out I have to have faith. What is faith? How do I get this faith? Do you know what faith is? I'm not sure I can explain it all to you. But faith is believing and receiving what God has revealed. What God has revealed in this book. What God has revealed in nature. What God has revealed in conscience. And it can be defined as that trust in the God of the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom He sent for salvation. Faith is personal trust apart from any works in Jesus Christ. I cannot work my way to heaven. After I receive Christ as Savior, I prove that I'm a Christian by my works. But you cannot do one single thing to earn one minute in heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. My salvation does not depend on even 1% of what I do or am. It depends entirely on the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and the fact that I have received him as my Lord and my Savior. But after I'm saved, I am sinning every minute and every day if I'm not working for my Savior and abiding in him. And faith without works is dead, said James. Now, the Bible teaches that faith is the only approach to God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And the Bible tells us that faith is commanded. Jesus said, have faith in God. And that's an imperative there in Matthew uh, or Mark 11. And then on another occasion, John said, and this is his commandment. This was the commandment of Jesus. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a command. God commands you. He commands you. He gives you an order. Believe. Believe, 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 believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no other way that you can approach God, no other way you can know God, no other way you can come in contact with God except through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. What is faith? the reception of the gospel, confidence in God and His Word, being confident of this very thing, a total dependence on Christ for our forgiveness and for the fulfillment in our lives. Did you ever hear the story of John Payton? 
the great missionary in the New Hebrides. He was translating the scriptures, trying to learn their language. And he couldn't translate the word faith, and he worked on it for months and months and months, and he couldn't find a word for faith. And one day he saw a man lying on a low reclining chair that supports the weight of the whole body. And John Payton said, what are you doing? And the man said, reclining. Payton jumped up and he said, I've got my word for faith. It's reclining on Jesus. And here's how he translated it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever reclineth his whole weight upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that reclineth his whole weight upon him is not condemned. But he that reclineth not his whole weight upon him is condemned already because he hath not reclined his whole weight upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. Have you reclined your whole weight upon Christ and Christ alone? Or are you counting on a little bit of your own goodness and counting on a little bit of church anity? I can't go down here to a church and get on a pew and recline on the pew and say I'm saved. This pew is saving me. No, it's not. You recline on Christ. Your faith is in Christ the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. Faith means that I receive and that I do something about it. I'm asking you tonight to put your whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. Just Jesus. And then the third thing that you cannot do without First, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Second, without faith, you cannot please him. Thirdly, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, of course, Jesus in this chapter is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about fruit bearing. In other words, without me, you cannot bear any fruit. After you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit is the representative of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. He went away. He sent the Spirit of God here to this earth. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you put your whole weight on Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you, and He lives through you and in you and he lives the Christian life through you. Now, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible is this 15th chapter of John. And those of you that come forward tonight, we're going to give you a gospel of John. And I hope you'll read this chapter right away because it's an important picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. You see, this is the grapevine that he's talking about. And grapevines were grown all over Palestine in those days and they needed a lot of attention. They grew fast. And they were drastically pruned every December and January. And they bore two kinds of branches, those grapevines. One was fruit-bearing, and the other bore no fruit at all. So the, not, the, the branches that bore no fruit were drastically pruned back so that they would drain away none of the strength from the root and from the vine itself. Now, the wood of the vine has the curious characteristics that it wasn't good for anything. It was too soft for any purpose, so they would take these false branches, these branches that didn't bear anything, and have a big bonfire with them. And Jesus says his followers are like that. Some of them are lovely, fruit-bearing branches of himself. Others are useless because they bear no fruit. And Christians, professing Christians, whose Christianity consists of just professing without practice, words without deeds. I believe the Bible from cover to cover, and I believe the whole the cover because it says Holy Bible, somebody said. A man told me, he said, I'm a fundamentalist with a big F. And he, he looked as mean as I've ever seen. 
He meant it too. And he was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're right with God. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering. All those fruits of the Spirit. They are to characterize the true believer in Jesus Christ. By their fruits ye shall know them, said Jesus. By their fruits ye shall know them. There are many of you here tonight, you look like a Christian. You act like a Christian in many ways, but deep inside there's no abiding in Christ. There's no life, there's no sap. The fruit isn't there. Three ways in which we can be useless branches. One, you can refuse to listen to Christ at all. Second, you can listen and then render him lip service unsupported by deeds. Thirdly, you can accept him as master and make him Lord of your life. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, you not only accept him as Savior, but you accept him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He must be Lord of your eyes, Lord of your ears, Lord of your tongue, Lord of your hands, Lord of your feet, Lord of your pocketbook, Lord of your bank account, Lord of your family. He's first in every area of your life. Is he in yours? Or are you among the branches that need to be cut off? And he said that he cuts them off, he prunes them back, and they're thrown into the fire. Always remember that the branch that bears no fruit must be destroyed if the rest of the vine is to be preserved. Even among true believers that's true because we have in the Bible a very strange passage that I don't have time at this moment to go into, the sin unto death. I believe that there are Christians true believers that many times die before their time. Are you abiding in Christ? Jesus withdrew himself into solitary places to meet God, and we must do the same thing. We must keep contact with him every day. It must be constant and deliberate. Never a day when we do not sense his presence. And without this abiding, you cannot do anything that will be spiritually pleasing to God. Without me, you can't bear supernatural fruit. But with him, I can love that fellow over there that normally I wouldn't love. With him, I can be gentle when normally I might want to hit him in the face. With him in my life, living through me, I can forgive the wrongs that have been done and the things that were said. With him, the life can be lived. Because you see, nowhere in the New Testament does it tell me, Billy Graham, to live a Christian life. It tells me that the old Billy Graham must die and Christ must live through me and in me. He does the living through me. If I'm daily, moment by moment, abiding in him. It's his sap that gives me the strength and the life, the spiritual life that I must have. By their fruits ye shall know them. Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Without faith I cannot please him. Without me ye can do nothing. I'm going to ask you tonight to receive Christ into your heart. Let him forgive your sins. I'm going to ask you to recline all your weight. Maybe you've put 90% of your weight, but I'm asking you tonight all your weight on Christ. I'm asking you tonight to make him Lord as well as Savior of your life. You may be a member of the best church in town, but you really need Christ in your heart. You may not be a member of any church, whoever you are and whatever you are. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you. Get up and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ in my heart. I want forgiveness. I want to put my whole weight on him. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. We're going to give you some literature. 
then you can go back and join your friends. If you've come with friends and relatives or come in a bus, they'll wait. It won't take but just a moment in this stadium. You come quickly right now. Hundreds of you from everywhere. You may be in the choir. And you've been singing all these nights, but you're not sure that Christ is in your heart. You come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. As you that are watching by television can see, there are hundreds of people here at the University of New Mexico that are coming to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make your commitment where you are now. You can put your whole weight on him and say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life, and he will. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus. Matthew 12, old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims 
and delims a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazine made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf and there came running up to us some men and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, the shadow of the boomerang. She played the part of a nurse and she was a very wonderful girl and she went out with her fiance and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand and she wasn't in water more than waist deep and a shark came along and took off her leg. And she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish story both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture has come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright and some of it very sophisticated to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah? Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord it doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? Because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says 
that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you're called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be, and you're going to find tough going. Because, you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers. And then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God. And he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish. And the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first, it'll be smooth going. You'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do. And I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, Whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up and the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep and they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives. They began to pray and finally Jonah told them, that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God and they said, what do we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row and they threw everything else over, but the storm got worse and worse and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally in desperation, they threw Jonah over and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish. Now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God 
to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do, and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent! 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 Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God and God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us, but if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University. And you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to him tonight. And God will forgive the past. And give you another chance and another moment to serve and follow him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you and God is a merciful God and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ and you have refused to repent. They'd never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. 
they will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came. And he was tired and he was angry. And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah. And the next morning a worm came and cut it off and it fell. And Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him. And God said, Jonah, you're worried about that gourd And you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh. And that's how the book of Jonah ends. And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You are more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you. You've got a computer system down there. It's your will. And you have the ability to choose whether you're going to serve Christ and whether you're going to serve God in his kingdom and put yourself in the will of God and say, oh Lord, I'll march in your army. I'll march under your flag. I'll go out with love in my hearts to try to help change the world. I'll go out and do your will no matter what it costs, whether it's a burning desert or a steaming jungle. I'll go out even if it means I have to break up with my boyfriend who doesn't live for God. I will go out, O oh Lord, and serve you no matter what the cost. And Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to pay the price, then quit it. Don't even fool with it. It's costly to follow Christ. But I want to tell you the rewards are absolutely unbelievable. The reward of joy and peace and security, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that you're in the will of God, whatever comes and whatever goes. I'm going to ask hundreds of you tonight to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say tonight, I want Jesus Christ into my heart. I want him not only as Savior, but I want him as Lord. I want to put myself in his hands. I want his forgiveness. I want his transforming power. And I'm willing to serve him if he should call me. And I'm going to ask older people and younger people, you need Christ, whoever you are, I'm going to ask you to come. 
and stand. And after you've all come and stood, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus or a delegation from a distant city, they'll wait. It'll only take a couple of three minutes for you to come, perhaps more from the upper stands. But get up and come now. Bring your friend with you. Whole families can come together. You need Christ tonight. You want Christ to be yours, and you're ready to pay the price, whatever it costs, to serve and follow Christ. You get up and come quickly from all over this stadium. We're going to wait on you right now. Men, women, young people. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask us to come? Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. It's very important that you come publicly and openly and declare yourself for Christ. Many people are already on the way. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, the 102nd Psalm, and beginning with verse 5. Well, say just six. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Today, I went for a few minutes out into the foothills and took a little walk down a little road. I didn't want to go too far because they told me there were rattlesnakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live, so we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. But she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China, a in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit, and I watched a bird. I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird, and it has different colors. It may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post, and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now, we have a lot of doves where I live, and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together, and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone, and I thought about this passage of Scripture that's found in the 101st of 102nd Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. Fifty-one percent of your population is single, and many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. 
Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure, but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot, lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respecter of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper. And it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, 
creates a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life, made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him at times, he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna, that same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell. All the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God. Because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture. And the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face and fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. 
He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh, yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage, who you ought to marry. There's a lady talked to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or ten years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, their boys somewhere, and let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. <laughs> but we prayed, and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons. Both, for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross, and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work 
And after dinner, I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while, but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you called those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their Savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3, 16, and the people here said it all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And last night, more than 1,700 people came and made their commitment to Christ. A few weeks ago, no, no. A few weeks ago, in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse. And the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, put your name there. Whosoever believeth or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son. And you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you but just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly.
As you can see, many hundreds are responding to the invitation of Mr. Graham to make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. You too can make that same decision. There's a phone number on your screen right now. This is your number for spiritual help and counseling. Write the number down. If the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Special friends are standing by to talk with you and pray with you. Make that call now. And you in other parts of the country that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in at home, or in a bar, or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado are making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you. And this reminder again, as Mr. Graham has just told you, we'd like to talk with you and pray with you. So make that telephone call now. The number is there on your screen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.